Yes, good morning. So this is truly a momentous time in our university's history. For only the 17th time since 1851, the University of Minnesota is searching for its next president. At the start of this search, the Search Advisory Committee visited all five campuses across the state to gather input from the campus community. Your input has had, tremendous, has had a tremendous impact on the deliberations and ulti that ultimately brought Provost Giebel to campus today. So now we're back where it all started, getting input from the university community. Provost Giebel is traveling to all five campuses before her interview with the Board of Regents on Friday, and this is one of five public forums this week. After the forum today, please uh, provide your input to the Board of Regents on the Presidential Search website. There are cards at the entrance of the theater, and please take one with you. It lists the website where you can submit feedback. Before I introduce our presidential finalist, I'll explain the format for today's forum. Provost Gable will make a few remarks, and then we'll turn it over to question and answer session. If you'd like to ask a question, please write your question on the note card and get it to one of the staff in the audience. If you didn't grab a card on your way in, just raise your hand and someone will bring one to you. So now it's my pleasure to introduce our finalists for the position of the University of Minnesota's 17th president, Joan T.A. Gable. Provost Gable currently serves as the executive vice president for academic affairs and provost at the University of South Carolina, a position she's held since 2015. She was previously the dean of the University of Missouri's Trulask College of Business and prior to that, she held faculty and administrative positions at Florida State University and Georgia State University. Provost Gable earned her bachelor's degree in philosophy from Haverford College in Pennsylvania and her Juris Doctorate from the University of Georgia. She and her husband, Gary, have three children, a daughter who lives and works in Seattle, a son who is a junior in college, and a son who is a junior in high school. Please join me in welcoming Provost Joan Gable. Thank you, Amy. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. I hope you know how exciting it is for someone like me to show up and have all of you sitting here looking back at me. What that says about this campus and this community is incredibly exciting to me, and I really look forward to answering your questions. So I'm gonna keep my own remarks pretty short because I wanna use this time as effectively as possible to learn from you and help you learn from me or about me to the extent that you want to. But what I will say as we get Get started today is first of all I have to thank the Board of Regents and the search committee and everyone who came to a listening session provided anonymous feedback or otherwise engaged in the process because I can tell you that it led to an incredibly professional interesting informative process and it's why I'm here and so I'm very grateful for the hard work of everyone who led to this point and we also have to thank all of the staff who behind the scenes make something like this happen this is a big production and they're amazing ambassadors and representatives of the university and I'm very grateful to them for all the work that they've done so that all of these kinds of events run smoothly and we have this kind of opportunity to talk but with that said I want to start by saying that I've been in higher education for the better part of my adult life, and it has changed a lot during that period of time. And as I look around the room and I see community members, students, faculty, staff, administrators, those of us who've been doing this for a while really are seeing palpable change in what it means to be part of this really noble enterprise of education and discovery and in community engagement. And some of those changes are resulting in pressure that not all of us like or enjoy, <laughs> that doesn't necessarily make the work feel the same way that it used to. But the universities that will come out of this ahead, the universities that will emerge better from this time of transition that we find ourselves in, are universities that have a deep investment in discovery, that understand what students need in the classroom and beyond the classroom, that understand what it means to serve their state while they impact the world, and this university knows how to do that. I've never seen a university better positioned to be the kind of university that 
recognizes legacy and is ready for what the future holds in a positive way with a contribution that we'll be talking about in the next 170 years with your, I don't know, 34th president <laughs> of the university by that time. So I, don't, I wanna stop there and open the floor to questions and hear what it is that you would like to talk about. So I'll invite Amy back out, who was on the search committee, very grateful for her service in that regard, and we'll get started. All right, well, we already have some questions that were uh, submitted. And I'll start with one that, there's, that really emerged from one of the main themes that came out of our listening sessions prior to uh, creating the position profile and so forth. And that was that the next leader of the, of the University of Minnesota needs to really make the case for higher education. So the value of higher education is being questioned nationally. How would you respond to that? Well, it's, it's an ongoing conversation. You see this in all corners of the country. You see it in the state where I live now. And you see it across constituencies where you may not necessarily expect it because it is an investment to engage with a university as a faculty member, as a student, as a partner in the community. And it is our responsibility to make sure that we tell that story well. And it's a change culturally for those of us who work in higher education to talk about what we do beyond our peers. It's, we're very comfortable describing our research to each other. We're very comfortable sharing our expertise with our students. And depending on the kind of work that we do, we're very comfortable working with a specific community partner. But talking beyond that in the past has felt like bragging. And that is not <laughs> comfortable for most of us. But the fact is, we do do amazing things for the communities that we serve. And those communities are right here, and they extend around the world. So of course, we prepare students for lives well lived to be really positive, fulfilled members of society who can ask hard questions and expect answers and have fulfilling careers in whatever way that they want to make those contributions. We are capable and currently are and can improve as a beacon for what it means to be welcoming and inclusive, create a sense of belonging for everyone within the community. We do discover new ways of doing, thinking, providing, curing. I mean, I don't even know how long I could make that list <laughs> without leaving something important out, but the list is long and valuable and impactful. And we are a driver for economic development. The resources that are invested in the university yield for the state, for all of us in the state and beyond. And we need to remind people of that. We need to be prepared to describe that in the specific classes that we offer, the programs that we offer, the research that we do, and the way in which we serve the state through our extension offices, across all the counties, through our campuses, across the system, and of course, right here in the Twin Cities. And so I think that this is the, the new approach that university presidents need to have, is that in addition to facilitating and stewarding a well-run institution that does all of those things in research, teaching, and service, that they are prepared to talk to various stakeholders and constituencies about what's going on, be transparent, communicate, be prepared to take hard questions. I suspect there are a few of them coming. Respond to those questions in a way that provides information or the redirect to the person who has the information, and to be able to talk about the overall value, because we know, because we're invested, that this is obviously an incredibly worthy enterprise that we've partnered with, that we are a part of, that we devote our lives to. But we need to make sure that other people know that too. All right, thank you. Uh, the second question that came in, and this also is really in, in alignment with the things that we heard during the listening sessions as this uh, process began, and it made it, uh, made it into the profile in a very prominent way. And it's the question about diversity. And a recent Star Tribune article on you highlighted your commitment to diversity in students as well as faculty and staff. And so I'd like to hear more about your beliefs and what you've done to correct inequities. So I would consider this, and this may be a slightly overused term, so forgive me, but I would consider this one of the grand challenges of society in general and specifically for university campuses, which is how do we lead on what it means to be welcoming, inclusive, create a sense of belonging, and why should it be us? And I think the why is easier to answer because we are the 
ones with the best ability to steward what happens next across a variety of points of reference. And so if we want to think ahead about the value of appreciating multiple perspectives, the ideas of how dignity and respect actually lead to better discovery, better instruction, how the recognition of what has happened historically is iterative and can inform the future across a state like this across every state in the country and around the world. This plays to our strengths. We are thinkers. We do like to discover. We like to prepare ways to have robust conversations. And that is something that we can do really well. So we can and should lead this conversation. But then it also comes back to the fact that we're an enterprise that's operating every day. So who's coming here? Who's working here? Are they getting their needs met? Are they, is their voice represented and heard in a way that's meaningful and has impact? And so we've tried to take what is really a grand issue and break it down into component parts so that we could start to see where the gaps really are rather than um, just feeling the sense that there are gaps and act on those in short order while making plans for long-term improvement. So things like student composition, of course, and ensuring that there are really strong pipelines into various communities so that the student body is representative of a population of the state, that the faculty and staff are representative of the population of the state. We are not there yet where I am now, but we've made discernible progress by being purposeful and intentional and creating programs that are likely to yield success. Mm -hmm. With the faculty, both in their composition and in the support uh, for work and discovery, we've created a multitude of layered advisory committees, some with students, some with faculty, some with staff, some with community members. And then we wanted to make sure we didn't have advisory committee fatigue, where everybody's working busily on committees and not necessarily <laughs> seeing outcomes. So we created essentially what has become an executive council. And one of the things that have, has come from that that I think has made and has the potential in an ongoing way to make the most difference is we decided to invest in a chief diversity officer in each academic unit and in each of the major service units like student affairs. And that is an investment of resources, an investment of time. The person who fulfills this role is at the rank of associate dean or equivalent in each unit. And that means that they're not doing as much teaching and research. And so that is a conversation and a thought process that every faculty member needs to have. And then they become subject matter experts for the unique opportunities and challenges of the disciplines in their unit, the students in their unit, but they also become an advisory committee for each other. So this isn't done in isolation, it becomes a network it becomes a, a sharing of best practices and ideas. We have people deployed now to conferences from all different points of view, bringing that information back. And from that has come a variety of activities that we're starting to see yield on things like campus climate surveys, different types of speaking events, but what topic, why, when, around the class schedules, around people's obligations, in ways that we may not have known or been as uh, sensitive to if we weren't hearing from this group that has made this effort so distinctly. There's a lot more, but in the interest of time, I'll say that that's really where we've started, some of the 30,000-foot uh, highlights. But I also want to say that it's a, it's a long game. And this is the kind of thing that if you assume, oh, I've done these two or three things and now we're done and everything's fine, that is um, probably not an advisable strategy. So instead, I think it's very important to say that everywhere, at every institution, and at the University of Minnesota, it's very important to consider this just woven in, part of what the university does, part of what the university, in the front of its mind, thinks about in order to continue to improve in this area. Great, thank you. All right, one of the questions that just came in was uh, something that, I think this question is something you, it's not surprising to you, but the question is specifically, how do we balance all the conflicting goals that we have in academia? So this person has itemized out you know, lower tuition and competitive salaries, high quality facilities, research support, maybe even some of the initiatives that, you know, investing some of the initiatives you just got done describing. So how do we balance all of these conflicting goals? Well, operationally, that's the hardest challenge. In, in running the place is figuring out how to say yes to every good idea 
knowing that you can't because there are not unlimited resources. And so that is where strategic planning comes in and strategic planning in an inclusive and open way, much like the um, process that you saw leading up to where we are now with this search, but in an even broader sense because there are ways for universities to do a lot of things at the same time, and we do do a lot of things at the same time and very well with a lot of legacy and impact and value. But when you're looking at um, choosing, there needs to be a structure around how you would make that choice and you need to develop that structure in an inclusive way, leveraging the fact that there are a lot of really smart people here who really care a lot about the place and come at it from different points of view and really can often advise you in ways that you would not see on your own if you're nose down at your own desk just thinking about what to do with your day. That's great. So uh, one of the, at all the different listening sessions we had, students uh, came, to, came to them and often expressed the same issue, which is they want a president who knows what their life is like and what their experience is like as a student and all the different aspects that they're confronted with and dealing with. And so as a president, how do you keep your finger on the pulse of what's happening with the student body? And I think thinking about the student body and all the different kinds of student bodies we have, undergraduate, graduate, professional, et cetera, mm -hmm. um, at this university. You know, I had a very, it's a very good question because I would have answered that question differently about six years ago than I do now. And the reason for that is my children came to college age. And <laughs> so I thought I knew what was going on. And then I sat in the room while other people presented to me as a parent. And I, wow. <laughs> so. So there's a couple of layers to that, of course. One is it's good to be humbled every now and then and be reminded, you know, you work really hard and you think you know what you're doing. And it's good to sometimes be reminded that there's a lot more to know all of the time. And the other is that I am a student of my own children's experience and they're only a few data points, but they, I'm seeing it differently now than I did before and I will need to continue because you know as things go they're gonna finish and things will continue to change and what their experience was like may not reflect what happens to the students who come after them. But what I learned from this added uh, aha moment perspective of having my own children attend uh, university was that it's really important to be boots on the ground with students. So it's very easy in the role that I'm in now and in the role of the president to be very in touch with student government leaders, right? You meet them, they, they're on your calendar, and of course you maintain that kind of of face-to-face -face interaction, and students are really good at picking who they want to speak for them. But in the process of becoming a student government leader, that almost becomes like a, 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 a whole separate part of that student's life. And so it's also important to be visible and available to students who may not feel comfortable stepping up that way or may be attending university in a way where they wouldn't know the student government leaders. And so there are different ways to do that. Some of it is just being visible and being at events and showing up and being open and being willing to stand there and take a question even if you don't know the answer, which is often the case. Uh, or um, having scheduled events periodically, whether they're social or they have a thematic conversation. We do this sometimes around speakers with receptions before or after so that we know we can have a deeper dive conversation about a topic of difficulty and then we have the benefit of subject matter expertise with the speaker or sometimes they're just fun. But you have to make moments like that happen and also evoke a sense of approachability because one of the gifts of being in higher education is being in the company of students. I mean, if you're ever worried about the future, spend a few minutes with a university student and you will feel better. So that is a wonderful part of the work. Great, thank you. So a lot of times, sci the sciences, engineering, um, gets a lot of attention. Mm -hmm. So this next question wants you to speak to the role of arts in your own life as well as your interest in the role of arts at the University of Minnesota community and beyond? Well, I give this a lot of thought because I myself was a philosophy major and went to a very small liberal arts college for my undergraduate education and thought it was an amazing and transformational experience. Now, my own children went to large public universities and I think they had amazing and transformational experiences too. So I think you can find this where you are and what speaks to you as a student 
But the this that I'm referring to is the idea that our responsibility is to provide students an education. And education is a multi-layered thing. It, of course, is skills and competencies and employability. We can't, I mean, this is obviously a very big part of the conversation, but that is critical for the first job, maybe the second job. What is critical to life? What is critical to being able to be a fulfilled and productive member of society? What is critical to being able to discern when all of the um, controversies or complicated issues arise in society, and we should be providing an education that improves our students' ability to function effectively in that kind of environment, which I think also makes them more employable, by the way, even if it isn't necessarily in the skills and competencies listed in a job description. And I say this as a former dean of business who was preparing students and stewarding programs that were very specific and applied, but were anchored in a core of competencies that included skills like critical thinking, communication, ability to discern current events, historical context, which were woven into the curriculum and were assessed as part of the preparedness for that degree. All right, thank you. So the next question is around the mental health crisis that I know it's not unique to the University of Minnesota and I'm certain you are seeing this as well at the University of South Carolina. So uh, we know that we have a challenge among our student population. Um, so what have you seen on this issue at South Carolina and what have you done or did you do to address student concerns there? Yeah, this is a national conversation and unfortunately it's not unique to anyone. And it is, the word crisis is often connected and I think with good reason. So uh, there is a lot of very rapid movement across both academic affairs and student affairs and also with community partnerships to make sure that our students feel safe in every context of that word, but talking specifically about mental health. So we've done a few things that are sort of you know, operational, like hiring more uh, counselors, changing the schedule, um, the, the time methodology for getting an appointment, making it easier, um, also doing things that enable better and um, more accessible off hours support. So just the support network is improving um, as part of our response to this. We're also uh, doing a lot of benchmarking against what other institutions are doing in terms of peer support, in terms of faculty preparedness, who are uh, for a very distinct portion of the day, the frontline observers and partners to the students as they are part of the university community. But of course, most of our faculty are not trained to identify a student who may be struggling or to know what to do when they learn that that student is struggling. And I've never met a faculty member who wouldn't have wanted to help. So the idea of giving the faculty those resources so that they can get the student to where the help is fundamentally provided has made a pretty enormous difference. And we work really closely with student government who've taken this up as a platform on behalf of the students who are themselves benchmarking with their peers and across best practices. And we're working with them to implement some of the changes that they have suggested as well. Thank you. There are several, several questions. I'm going to try to combine them okay. into one. We'll see how, <laughs> how cohesive this becomes. Um, so there are a lot of questions that have been submitted asking just to know a little bit about you and about your style, your leadership style, and specifically working with all the different groups at a university of this size. So can you talk a little bit about your leadership and management style and experience with um, you know, aspects working with staff in your office, working with uh, shared governance with faculty, um, professional staff, students, et cetera. Uh, how do you, tell us a little bit about your style. Okay, uh, well, I really believe that because institutions like the University of Minnesota, also like the University of South Carolina, are so large and complex, there's no way that one person can know <laughs> everything, or even a very small fraction, frankly, of everything that it takes to make a university successful. And so one of the things that I have enjoyed the most and have been mentored on by the president at the University of South Carolina and have learned from him and from other mentors is you surround yourself with really smart people who balance each other well, balance you well, care about the institution, and then you let them do their job. And hopefully you do that in a way where they feel 
very open to share their ideas, that you can hear pushback in a welcoming way and improve from it. You laugh every now and then. You're, you make fun of yourself every now and then so that you don't take it all too seriously. And then you pull together a few good ideas. And then, of course, you execute. Now, that's a whole other conversation, probably. And if we have time, I would be happy to address it. But the, the, I, I think that the leadership style, it's a very classic if you will, interview answer to say, I'm a collaborative leader who you know, reaches out to the community to create buy-in for the vision. I mean, that's what I'm going to say. But, but <laughs> what I mean by that is that I really, that if you, that you're never going to meet a university president who has taught every course in the university, who has researched in every way that the faculty engage in discovery, who has had the life experience of every student who comes onto this campus or any of the system campuses who has represented the community as an elected official, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It doesn't exist. So how you create people who fill that and, and together and then work together well with each other, they have the expertise and they have the compatibility, that's what I consider leadership. Thank you. OK, here's another. Um, combined question from several, 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 several cards. So there are several cards that are referring to some aspect of online education, distance education. Mm -hmm. And at the University of Minnesota, we are um, in the middle of really exploring what our future is and what kinds of uh, investment we see in online programs and how to do that best, but also just uh, enriching and augmenting the educational experience here to optimize that. So if you could just talk more sort of somewhat globally about your thoughts about online education, the role it plays in a university, programs, augmenting experiences, et cetera. Oh, I would love to. So I taught online for the first time when I was a member of the faculty in 1998. Ooh. <laughs> there are people in here who weren't born yet. <laughs> uh, and we had to code it ourselves, and it was a rolling uh, a scrolling chat. Does anybody remember oh, that? I yeah, there's yes. a few nods in the room. <laughs> that was not a particularly effective <laughs> platform for certainly for engaging students or for you know disseminating knowledge in a way that could yield to a really solid learning outcome. But it was very clear even in those early days that this was coming and we needed to get ready for it. So fast forward, things look very, very different now. And there are a lot of real opportunities with online distributed, uh, I think in short order we're going to have a next vocabulary for what this means because really online education, if you put any of your materials up online or if you as students access any materials off of it, we're already, everyone's already doing something online. Uh, it's not like you hand everything out in class and write on a chalkboard anymore. It's just not the way we do it. So there are some real opportunities with distributed learning with leveraging technology to impart knowledge. There are access points that you can create that you otherwise can't have for students in their circumstances and meeting them where they are. There are ways to use class time in what we're calling flipped classrooms so that you can um, disseminate materials in advance for students to do in their own time. It gives them flexibility so that they can engage in leadership opportunities, work, family obligations, whatever are their interests outside of the classroom. They can be away from campus. There are um, incredible opportunities to offer classes that may not fit in normal business models of minimum enrollments. You can do one-offs and special subjects in ways that make sense given the way that we run the place. And you can open up bottlenecks that happen in some of our classes where we see floods of student interest, pushes of student interest, and sometimes we can't move fast enough yeah. in faculty <laughs> hiring to meet that interest in real time. So the, the thoughtful work around distributed learning can be really interesting opportunistically in terms of content access and, and just um, efficiency across the campus. It does require a strategy, though, because what happens otherwise is it's, it's a little bit more uh, uh, organic. And then you may not be launching a course 
in order to solve one of those problems. And sometimes that's okay. Sometimes we launch courses because they're interesting to the professor who wants to teach it or interesting to the students who want to take it, and then we discover there's all these other positive attributes. But I think it is better for the university, especially one as large and complex as the University of Minnesota, to do it with a shared governance model where you discuss these different ways in which online and distributed learning can be beneficial and you prioritize them and then figure out how to backfill the resources, fiscally, expertise, instructional design, curriculum review by the faculty, student demand, et cetera, and, and then launch. All right, thank you. All right, I'm gonna do another uh, aggregate <laughs> question. <laughs> Look at all these it. cards, it's really <laughs> fantastic. Um, there are several cards here that are dealing in some aspect to what I'll globally describe as alternative revenue sources. Mm -hmm. And you know, how to think about um, entrepreneurism across the state, how alumni and the broader state community might play into some innovative thinking around that um, as well. And so many people are asking, what are your thoughts about how do we go after alternative sources of revenue and have that drive some of the innovation that yeah. we're seeking? Well, I'll start by saying that I think revenue is good. Um, <laughs> revenue is a good thing. Uh, I think that uh, I had a, when I became a dean uh, a few years ago, a member of the board of that business school who was a very senior ex executive at a Fortune 100 company said, "Be clever, but never forget who we are." Hmm. And it's one of those pieces of advice that you get in life that you sort of have on a repeat loop. <laughs> Uh, that I hear in my head often, and that he, he has said to me several times since. In fact, you might not be surprised to hear recently. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> so what does that mean in reply to your question? So I think that it is incumbent upon universities to evolve, and we do do things that are probably monetizable that we have not monetized. And I don't think there's anything wrong with exploring those opportunities, uh, whether it be in some of the potential audiences for our curriculum and content that we haven't reached before, whether it be in how we partner up to engage in discovery, whether it be in the kind of work our students do in the classroom, in the applied projects that they do with partners or beyond the classroom in their service, whether it be in tech transfer and commercialization and probably a very long list of other things that our faculty, staff, and students would think of that don't necessarily occur to me. But I don't want uh, alternate revenues to start to creep into core mission, and I think that that's where the leadership and the shared governance and the um, open input cycle comes in, that when you explore alternate revenues, they should be clever and innovative, but also fit who you are, so that they don't become um, the driver and pull you away from core mission and then undermine the value of what it means to be the you. You know, that's precious and it's a legacy and it requires nurturing and stewardship. But I absolutely believe that those two things can coexist. Thank you. So right now we're in the middle of a major presidential initiative to prevent uh, sexual misconduct. Mm -hmm. And so there are also several questions here about asking you to share your thoughts, ideas, visions, commitment to responding to and preventing sexual misconduct at the University of Minnesota. Yeah. Uh, well, of course, I will start by saying that the only acceptable outcome is uh, zero, and meaning zero assaults, and that the uh, there's nothing worse, there are very few things I can imagine being worse to experience, and that it is absolutely critical that we do everything we can to prevent, support, and handle properly upon. And that is obviously uh, what has to happen at every university. And it has become, a, a, I know, a very robust conversation here. And unfortunately, like several of the other things we've talked about already, is a national conversation. I have done a lot of observation and study on the approach that the University of Minnesota is taking. Um, in terms of really leveraging the know-how of our public health colleagues and thinking of this as a public health crisis and using the expertise of that 
um, both scientific area of study and the fact that it's a very applied field and in the communities in which we serve, including, including this community, to try to really get at what it means to effectively prevent. And I think that that is well underway and uh, tied in with the kind of support services we were talking about earlier with mental health, some of the technological services. I know uh, like Callisto and other tools that campuses are using really strong support with law enforcement to um, really emphasize prevention. Because of course, if we're successful there, then some of the other issues become uh, less acute. So with the unfortunate recognition that perfect prevention is unlikely and that we're not there yet, even if we're ultimately able to achieve it, then the idea is to make sure that your support structure on campus is fully aware of the unique attributes and issues of this type of crime, of the consequences of this type of experience, and works together to make sure that the support is absolutely world-class and top-notch. And with the kind of expertise and know-how we have on this campus, that is, we should be leading the charge and conversation on that. And then there is, at the end of the day, the compliance attribute, which many of you know is in real time changing right now with new advisory guidance and laws coming out from the Department of Education federally that create a fair amount of uncertainty about what the role of the university is. And so getting up to speed, I mean, this was just a couple of weeks ago. So getting up to speed as quickly as possible on what it means to do the right thing in terms of prevention and support and do the right thing legally and make sure that they are aligned with each other. But I uh, am uh, very grateful and and uh, glad to see the emphasis on prevention because not every university that has faced this challenge, this crisis, has focused its attention as much that way. And I think it is the right balance to strike across the overall effort to eliminate this crisis. Thank you. Can you talk about your experience and views on you know, cross-disciplinary collaboration and, mm -hmm. and efforts um, to bring units and ideas together at a large university. Oh, I would love to. So I came by some of this naturally because I was a lawyer in the business school. And so <laughs> if I wasn't willing to step into someone else's party and join their intellectual uh, pursuit, then I would have been very lonely in my <laughs> scholarship, and you may have already picked up that that wouldn't have been how I would have wanted to do it. So uh, the idea of working across teams was something that was a necessity for me, but in full recognition of the different ways in which we become scholars, in which we engage in our research, many of us are really brought up within the academy to benefit our, and are incentivized to work alone. Uh, with students perhaps, but not necessarily cross-disciplinarily. And that is a long-standing, you know, centuries-old tradition in many of the areas of study and has yielded some pretty interesting outcomes and discovery that are hard to argue with. But in the modern era, the value of looking at things across multiple perspectives is what employers expect our students to be able to understand and appreciate when they graduate. It's what many of the funding agencies are incentivizing and how they're supporting research and scholarship. And I think we're really starting to see, in varying degrees, pivots on editorial boards, review committees, across the mastheads of our favorite journals in recognizing that looking at questions from a broad point of view has value and can, in fact, advance the knowledge base. And I suspect that our students in the room who are doctoral students today who join the faculty and go up for tenure in what, seven, eight, nine, ten years, depending on where you are, four, five, six years, depending on where you are, will have a, a clearer set of expectations from tenure and promotion guidelines that reflect this cross-disciplinary work. So the role now, of course, is to, on campus, try to create those incentives so that you're moving at the right pace, leading the charge, finding the strengths, seeing where um, interdisciplinary and cross-disciplinary work might actually yield new strengths, and providing enough support so that then uh, the magic happens between the intellectual interests and compatibility of the faculty. Thank you. So there are several questions here that I think are related, although people who've submitted these questions, you can, you, if I'm mischaracterizing this, you can submit another one. Uh, <laughs> so I see it differently. but. 
there are several questions about the role that higher education, universities, but maybe specifically the University of Minnesota plays in helping to foster a healthy democracy. And how, as a university community, are we um, obligated to engage in some of these difficult conversations, um, help, that, help this be a space of, of debate and dialogue, mm -hmm. and climate change as a topic is often uh, inserted in uh, this question in the cards. So it's sort of a big question, but and I guess maybe it's sort of looping back to that first question of why higher education and what's the important role, but specifically around healthy democracy. That's a really good question. And it's something that uh, the leadership team that I'm in now talks about a lot. And, and I would say did not before, but things changed a lot in 2015 and 16 on higher education campuses. And I think we've seen some really positive outcomes from what was a difficult time, as is often the case, that it's through some painful moments that you find some of your best uh, movement forward. But what came to me during those reflections a couple of years ago and that I think are ongoing today is to really remember what it is that universities have that are specific to universities, and that is expertise across a lot of different fields and subject matters and a lot of people seeking to gain expertise in different ways. So those are specific to the university environment, lots of other attributes and assets and wonderful things too that are shared, but those are really epicenter university attributes. And so how do you take full advantage of expertise and the fact that you're surrounded by people who are curious and have chosen to be curious? And so what we've really tried to do in um, where I am now and what I want to continue to do in the future, hopefully here, is I want to uh, create forums and forum, I'll, I'm gonna explain to you in a second what I mean by that, for people to share their expertise so that they are informed and can explore their own curiosity with information rather than guessing or forming opinions based on um, something other than information. So, <laughs> so the, a forum can be a very traditional thing. I mean, we're having a forum right now and we do lots of things like this. But for example, at South Carolina, we have something called the Finding Common Ground forums and they generally involve people sitting in chairs and someone on a stage, but they do change depending on what it is we're trying to evoke. So in the first series, the conversations in 2016 when we started were very much about voice and what does voice mean. And so we had people come in who have uh, sometimes in very tumultuous times expressed voice and sometimes at great personal risk. And we had them speak to their expertise or had faculty who've studied those eras in our history or in that history elsewhere and speak to that with expertise. But then we also did performance art by two of our dance faculty and a national book award winning poet who are on the faculty to talk about how you might express voice using something other than words. And there were several others. If, uh, there are journalists in the room who can Google the Finding Common Ground forums on the Provost website. But that, that's just an example. I think that what you want to accomplish as a university is making sure your walls aren't too high, either within your own community across the different corners or in the community that you serve around the state, in this city around the state, and in a university like this, your community is also, also global, and leveraging the fact that there are people here who know more about difficult topics, challenging topics, confusing topics than anyone else, and that there are ways to share that expertise so that people can form their opinions with, with context. And that's really that what opinion they form, the beauty of the university is that is entirely up to you. And I think that that's the contribution that we can make in terms of a, a citizenry, democracy, those broad concepts. Right. Right. Thank you. Um, Okay, I'm late breaking question. Just came in. I think <laughs> okay. I'm going to. Let me drink a little water. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> prepare. Take prepare. So, this question is interesting. And I, so when the presidential search was announced here, um, there was a lot of 
discussion around non-traditional candidates, whatever that means, mm -hmm. and it means something different to everyone, it seems, uh, who was saying it. Um, so the question is asking, um, what might, so in what ways do you think you are somewhat non-traditional and traditional, and can you tell us uh, how you represent, uh, how you, how that plays out in your leadership styles and decision-making process? I'm, I'm resisting the urge to make a rather obvious joke right now. But, um, okay, so uh, yeah, we all well, got it. Yeah. <laughs> so I'll start with the most obvious attribute of what makes me, for this position, non-traditional. But I would say perhaps not non-traditional in general, which is that this university has not had a woman president before, and I think it is delightful that that may change. So, um, thank you. <laughs> thank you, uh, and thank you for the support. I, I was the first woman business school dean at the University of Missouri, and there was a little bit of a, a little smaller headline about that. And I was the first woman provost at the University of South Carolina, and there was a little headline about that. None of them have been quite as big as the headlines here, uh, as <laughs> not surprisingly. But what I would say about that is, is well, it's a fact, and it's okay to acknowledge that fact. It's a fact, acknowledge it. But uh, I think what's also important is, what do you do once you're in the job, when no one's gonna care <laughs> anymore? Uh, you know, five minutes after you start, it's about the work, right? And whether you're doing good work, and whether you're bringing the university from great to greater, and fulfilling the mission of the university, and I think that that is the responsibility of any president, regardless of what discrete characteristics they might bring to the table. Now, at the same time, I often get the question in different contexts, you know, what do you think is different about your career because you're a woman? And that one makes me laugh a little bit, too, because it's not like I can compare and contrast my own <laughs> life experience. But uh, I have, by virtue of some set of life experiences, a really deep and passionate desire for everyone to feel welcome at the table. I have wanted to feel that way. I want everyone to feel that way. I'm not sure if that's because of or just is. I know many men who feel that way too. But in any case, I do think that that is um, an appropriate way to take advantage of the fact that this is a pivot and an evolution and a symbol of that evolution but also that we also now just have to get to work and do good work on behalf of the university and take everything good about the place and nurture it and find the next new wonderful things to do and work together to make sure all of that happens. Right, thank you. There are a couple of questions here about the importance and role of international students mm -hmm. in, at our university. And um, if you could just comment on your perspectives on the role of international students and thought um, as a part of our community. I would love to. So my first administrative appointment was as the interim director of the Institute for International Business at Georgia State University. I uh, really found my um, ability to create multiplier effects, the value and fulfillment of administrative work doing international work for universities specifically, but also I do things like trade missions with the Department of Commerce and things like that too. Work with, inter because of the previous administrative posts I've had, work with multinational corporations and think about what it means to infuse a sense of cross-cultural competency, et cetera. The, I think that um, we could take it down to its most basic component part, which is every student who graduates from this university will be expected to work across boundaries, whether those boundaries are um, of people right next door but come from a different point of view or whether they're on a cross-cultural, cross-boundary team sitting online behind a computer with people from all corners of the word, world, the discoveries happening everywhere, the customers are everywhere, the problems to be solved are everywhere. And so how do you prepare students for this type of life and how do you as faculty and staff um, take advantage of this type of life to do better research, better scholarship, better performance, better curriculum design, better work in your own classroom. And in order to do that, you have to have a lot of different people in the room. And you have to have a lot of different points of view represented. So I think that universities absolutely benefit from having present 
um, international students, international faculty, international staff. I think this is part of how we serve the state right here at home. I also think that one of the beauties of being in a state that has a wide statewide reach, but also a major metropolitan area with a lot of uh, major company headquarters located here is that what happens in this state, and I know this because this has happened in my own family because I have family who moved here and stayed, is that this state and this city and others in the state are what our um, colleagues over in sociology would call sticky, meaning when you come here, you stay. <laughs> and this is a growing community. We have workforce needs in this community. We have capacity for very vibrant and fulfilling employment in this community, and I think we should be meeting those needs. And in order to do that effectively, you need to bring people here and then hope they stick. So uh, I think that this is part of the value proposition of a robust, complicated university community. Thank you. So we have a, we have a very robust governance program, um, process in this university um, across different groups, faculty, staff, students, um, our bargaining unit are all engaged. So can you just describe some of your experience with shared governance and uh, specifically maybe faculty shared governance, but just your ideas in general? I'm smiling at Amy because she asked me the same question during the <laughs> interview process in an earlier phase. So uh, I've worked in, um, at universities where the faculty were unionized and the university where I'm at right now, the faculty are not unionized, but very, very active faculty senate. And, the, uh, and I was uh, briefly, before I became the director of that institute that I referred to previously, a faculty senator back in the day. And uh, I, I think that the shared governance model is how all of the interesting advances that universities have made, uh, perhaps not in the individual research of the faculty, but in every other way, have happened. And that is not to say that it is not occasionally without frustration on both sides of the conversation, because people have different ideas about how to move forward. I think that's pretty typical. But from my experience, it's in that exchange and sometimes in that very tension where the interesting things happen. And some of that may be because I'm a lawyer and so tension is something that I know a little bit about. But the, <laughs> the, um, the idea of, of having different points of view but a shared end game goal is really something worth investing in and nurturing. And so what I've done specifically to actually answer your question is uh, I have what we informally call with the head of faculty senate and the um, chair elect of the faculty senate at South Carolina, we call it the bat phone. <laughs> old enough to remember what I mean by that. Just nod at me if you don't. But anyway, we are in regular communication with each other about a variety of issues. I'll tell you about one just because I can't resist, uh, which is that um, the state, uh, the northern part of South Carolina and the southern part of North Carolina are in a winter weather <laughs> advisory. Uh, I left the bad weather to come here. I just want everybody to reflect on that for a moment. But the university ended up not having to close, but might have had to if there were um, severe enough conditions. And that's the kind of decision that we make in real time in phone calls and group texts and if you can get to each other, depending on where people are. The last time we had to close for bad weather, the chair of the faculty senate was in the Czech Republic taking the phone calls at two o'clock in the morning for him. <laughs> but uh, we do those sorts of things so that we make sure when we're making major decisions, whether they're urgent or whether we see them coming, that we do it together. But also we have, uh, in, in exactly the same way as here, a very robust committee structure within the faculty senate. And I'm at a lot of those committee meetings, as are other people from my office. And then we're very, very open and purposeful about having faculty senators come to the administrator's retreat. We added that recently so that faculty senate could participate. Student government uh, leaders are invited too. Um, that was not the case before so that they can hear from each other both formally when we're doing this kind of thing but also in the hallway and as you're getting lunch and all the other times when sometimes the magic happens and the relationships are formed about what's top of mind for different groups, and then that often informs the agendas for future conversations. And that has worked uh, pretty well. That's not to say that we haven't disagreed on occasion. And actually, I think if you never disagree, maybe you're not investing hard enough in some of the hardest things, but we have found solutions on all of the difficult things that we've faced together. Thank you. 
Well, since you were talking about weather, oh, okay. and <laughs> uh, there's a question here that I'm just going to read it as is, but because um, I'm not sure how to rephrase it. But it says that you know this will be your first time living and working in Minnesota, and the question is, how do we know you will get us? In quotation marks. Um, so what? <laughs> tell us about uh, your expectations of being a a citizen of the state, <laughs> resident of the, of the state of Minnesota? That's a good question. I don't know how to tell you, you know, believe me, I'll get you. You know, I'll have to prove that to you <laughs> over time is the short answer to the question. But I will tell you a little bit about me that I think may ease some of the concern on that. So um, my father worked for the federal government, uh, so we moved every two years. Some of you may have had that kind of lifestyle too. So while I have never lived here, I do consider myself highly adaptable as a result of that experience. And one of my favorite things about having lived that life and having moved a few times as an adult and, and inadvertently also then imparting this on my own children is coming in and learning and embracing is really fun. And so I want to get you, and I'm studying you. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll probably stop there. Okay. <laughs> oh, thank you. Um, so you're going to be traveling to all five I campuses. Know, yes. uh, you have a big week ahead of you. Um, but this is an odd position because you're also you're the chancellor of this campus, Twin City campus. Mm -hmm. um, but the president of the whole system. And how will you balance those roles and lead in a way that is very, that is system focused? Yes, so uh, this is the exact same structure at the university where I am now. At the previous university where I was dean, it was the other version where there is a system office with a president and then each campus, including the flagship, has a separate chancellor. So I've seen both. There are pros and cons to both. Uh, but this is the way this system is structured. So, you know, you come in as it is. I have a wonderful mentor in the current president of the University of South Carolina, Harris Pestides, and what I've seen him do and then have been able to participate in as the academic officer is uh, that there are very specific value contributions that each system campus makes and then the collective makes a contribution and the way that you get to the best of that is by appreciating both and seeing how they fit together so on each campus of course there are unique curricular components unique faculty expertise local economic drivers uh, local relationships and partnerships that are that campuses and those would exist and have the resulting opportunities and challenges, whether they were part of the system or whether they were a standalone campus. Uh, and then there is systemness and what does it mean to then work together and create what is essentially an executive council of what it means to serve the state statewide and serve and find the opportunities that a state like this creates and offers that are unique to it and not something that any other system would naturally do. There are probably some you know, fat parts of the bell curve that every system is trying to accomplish, but the, on, on the tails is where you would find what's Minnesota about the University of Minnesota system, and the best people to identify that are the leadership teams and participants in the campus system, and that is, I think, a really distinct competitive advantage because the best way in which universities fulfill core mission, especially land-grant universities that have extension offices and legacy missions, is of course through the extension offices themselves and the local extension officers, but in intellectual pursuits, in, in instruction and research that reflects the corners of the state. And having both, that's a short list and it's great. It really is something to be proud of and to nurture. Thank you. Well, you've mentioned now the president of the University of South Carolina as being an important mentor. And someone has submitted a question asking, what other university presidents do you admire and why? And so I don't know if you can give us more information about why this person has been an important mentor for you and if there are other presidents that you've looked to for you know, inspiration or guidance. Well, of course, I think Eric Kaler is a wonderful president. and. <laughs> The work that he's done here is a very big part of why I want to succeed him. So that, uh, that goes without saying. 
Uh, I'm a very big fan of uh, Jerry Moorhead at the University of Georgia, but I have to be transparent in expressing why not only do I think he's a really good president, but he was my professor a while ago <laughs> when I was a student there. And he and I, you know, he's obviously been a president already for several years. We've kind of come up in a way together with uh, me being able to observe each incremental step in the progress of his career and what he's done on behalf of each component of the university that he's been responsible for on his journey and what it has really meant, really meant to leave something better than you found it in university life across different levels of the university. Those are the two presidents that I know the best and I really think they're both uh, incredible people and really got what it meant to create a university community that welcomed people in and what it pushed out made everyone around it better. And of course, uh, President Moorhead is in the middle of doing this. He's continuing to do this. And so I would list the two of them. Great, thank you. And Eric Kaler. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> okay, I'm just gonna read this question as it is. So it says, hockey, question mark, football, question mark, or basketball, question mark, um, although I think they're missing a lot of other sports. They don't yes. miss any other sports. What about volleyball? Especially here. Um, soccer? But tell us something, swimming? Tell us something about your view of the student athlete. <laughs> okay, so first of all, <laughs> uh, I, I saw some criticism that I might not understand hockey, and I want to express how deeply offended I am <laughs> by this observation. So I did grow up in Atlanta, but some of you are old enough to remember the Atlanta Flames before they became the Calgary Flames, games that I used to attend <laughs> when I was a child. And then later, minor league hockey, it was at the time the Gwinnett Gladiators, it's now the Atlanta Gladiators that I used to attend. And then I went to school in Canada for a year where I was able to refine <laughs> my affection for hockey and attend those games. So I beg your pardon. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so uh, I just, I'm personally a terrible athlete. I'm a very big fan. <laughs> Uh, and I enjoy sports, and I'm, it's a little like music for me. It's, I, it's you know, I enjoy the competition. I, I, I'm going to tap my toe to whatever rhythm is coming through the radio. So, I, I um, growing up in the southeast, football is well, it's pretty big there. <laughs> it's pretty big there, as is baseball. I didn't know as much about basketball. There's professional basketball, and of course there are college teams in Atlanta, but it is not um, quite the same uh, community driver sport that um, football and baseball are, although uh, you know, I went to my high school basketball games and a few college basketball games. But then I went to the University of Missouri, which at the time was in the Big 12 and was a consistent you know, tournament participant. And uh, the, one of the staff members in the athletic department there, and he'll know who he is if he sees this, uh, sat me down and said, okay, here's what you need to know about basketball. Um, and I'm not gonna tell you what he said. I know you're waiting for me to tell you what he said, but I'm sorry, I'm not, that's a longer conversation for another day. But he coached me up on how to be a fan, to understand um, how it was part of the front porch of the university athletic department portfolio and why um, I would and should enjoy it, which I did and do. So uh, that all worked out pretty well. But the student athlete, I really want to make sure we talk about because at the end of the day, what athletics began as and has the potential to do and I think does very well here with its moments of course, but on the whole does very well here is create an unbelievable learning environment for our student athletes who then contribute a wonderful component of our community experience and create a front porch of visibility for the university so that people who may not otherwise talk about discovery, innovation, instruction curriculum, are there and can be spoken to, persuaded, influenced, cajoled into remembering everything that the university does. The people who would find us for those contributions will find us anyway, but there's a whole other group of people who find us by virtue of the platform and front porch that athletics creates. So is it the most important thing that the university does? No, but is it an incredible opportunity for the university when it's done well? Absolutely yes. And do we wanna make sure that our student athletes are um, well instructed, prepared for life after competition, safe, yes. And I think that all of those things can very happily coexist. All right, thank you. 
So you had mentioned earlier, um, you know, this, this, how do you go from great to greater? Mm -hmm. And there are some questions that have been submitted about if you could share some of your vision about where you think the University of Minnesota can go from great to greater and some of our biggest opportunities. Yeah, so that's, of course, probably the trickiest question that you get at this phase of the conversation <laughs> because what I know about the university is we've had several robust conversations that led up to this point. Of course, we're having a, a conversation, all of you and I, <laughs> now. But I think that uh, uh, creating a bullet point list of here are the three things you need to do would be hubris because I... I need to get you, as you all asked me about earlier first. And also, that needs to be a shared governance conversation and how you would develop that kind of list. But here are the categories, broadly speaking, of opportunity that I see. So this university isn't coming into this very interesting and challenging time that we find ourselves in in higher education, um, upside down, if you will. And by that I mean it's not that the research enterprise is struggling here. The research enterprise is in the top 10 in the country here. It's not that students aren't interested in coming here. You're enroll you have a, an incredible demand of extremely qualified students who want to come here. And it's not like you don't have the attention of your state legislature. There, there, it, it was part of the platform speeches of your incoming um, elected officials across the board. And last but certainly not least, it's not like you don't have corporate America here tapping on your shoulder saying what's going on on campus. So when you look at that basket of attributes and you think about, well, the next bullet points aren't going to be a turnaround, right? That's not one of the things that we would be talking about for how we would rescue ourselves over the next um, whatever the reasonable arc, three to five years, five to ten years would be, which is great and not necessarily the story that every university is telling right now. But there are things emerging out of the research enterprise. I see some tremendous potential in the partnership with Fairview in academic medicine, academic health center. I think that there are tremendous opportunities to really look at what systemness might be in terms of meeting different gaps across the state, achievement gaps, inclusion gaps. Uh, and what that could mean in terms of instruction and in terms of research and discovery and service. And I think that there are probably layers of partnership that could be achieved in individual faculty research or the cross-disciplinary type of research that we're seeing more and more of that we would could tap into more deeply and more robustly. And that would probably yield the next set of bullet points as it's undergoing. But what I really look forward to is getting around the table and really learning what the bullet points might be and then getting going on them. That's one of the things that is the most fulfilling about being in a leadership role in a university is discovering the university and seeing where it has strengths, making the investments in those strengths, where it can meet some challenges, where it can make its own improvements that then improve the community that it serves. If that's not what you want to do, then this probably, <laughs> this probably isn't the job for you. So uh, that's, I really see that as the next chapter. All right, thank you. Well, this is your final question. Oh, okay. And it's a trick question. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and then after that, I'll see if you'd like just to give some closing sure. comments. We just have a few minutes left. And I'm also not originally from Minnesota, so I would answer this question differently. So this question were given to me, this trick question, I would answer differently. But this is a very specific Minnesota question. So, duck, duck, what comes next? <laughs> Now, I read something somewhere <laughs> about this. And so what I would, <laughs> can I say Sky Yuma instead? <laughs> yeah, that's you can. Yeah, that's good. And go Gophers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> or go Bulldogs, go. Yeah, and go et cetera. Yeah, yeah. Yes, of course. Thank you. All yeah. right. So uh, with that, if you have any closing comments, uh, we'll, we'll finish up the forum. OK. So I'll uh, finish where I started, which is to thank you. I know everyone in here is busy. And to stop your day and uh, inquire and give me an opportunity to share uh, what I see here and why I think this is such a tremendous opportunity I'm extremely grateful for. And I hope this is just the beginning of an ongoing conversation and that all of us have the chance to talk more, more deeply, 
um, with more specific topics soon. Uh, it's a very big part of what I see your next president doing. It's something that I hope I have the opportunity to do. And I'm really honored and humbled to be able to sit with you today. And uh, this is our first open forum of many. <laughs> and so I'm really looking forward to seeing how the whole uh, experience goes through this week across the state, but I'm just so delighted to start here with you today, and I thank you for your time. Thank you.